offer and invitation to treat. If you think back to the introductory podcast, I said that a legally enforceable contract needed six core elements. Offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations, certainty and capacity. In this podcast, I will introduce you to the notion of offer. In forming an agreement, one party makes an offer and the other party accepts that offer. Without an offer, there is nothing to accept, and so no basis for an agreement. What then is an offer? An offer is a statement by a party that they are willing to enter into an agreement on specific terms on the basis that, if those terms are accepted, the result is a binding contract. If a party accepts those terms, and the other contractual formality requirements are met, a binding contract is formed. This means that a party making a statement needs to have a clear understanding as to whether they have just made an offer from a contract law perspective, as otherwise they run the risk of someone accepting and a contract being formed. In your correspondence, for example, if you are discussing a possible contract, are you sufficiently clear whether what you are saying is, in fact, an offer capable of acceptance, or is just a discussion about what the terms of the offer would be, with the plan that, perhaps, you might issue such an offer in future. An offer has no fixed form. It can be an offer to just one person, or an offer to a group, or even an offer to the world. The traditional example of an offer to the whole world is a case from the late 19th century of Carlyle and the Carbolic Smokeball Company. In this case, a company, the Carbolic Smokeball Company, produced a device called a smokeball, which was designed to prevent the user from contracting flu. The company issued an an advertisement in which they offered to pay £100 to any person who used one of their smoke balls for a certain period of time and in a certain manner, but who still had the misfortune to contract flu. The claimant, Carlyle, used one of the company's smoke balls in the prescribed manner and still contracted flu. She applied to the company for her £100 payment, and the company argued that there was no contract between the parties under which she was entitled to be paid. They argued that the apparent promise of a £100 reward was a a mere puff, a clever piece of advertising designed to attract the consumer to the product, but which did not establish any legal duties. The claimant, Mrs Carlyle, won her case in first instance, and the Carbolic Smokeball Company appealed. If you read the case, and in particular the arguments of the defendant's counsel, you will see all manner of twists and turns by which they try to persuade the court that an advertisement to the world of this nature is not an offer capable of acceptance. But ultimately, they were unsuccessful. Sitting in the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Lindley dismissed the appeal, holding that the defendant's advertisement was sufficiently clear and precise in its terms that they had, in fact, made an offer which, by engaging in the conduct specified in the advertisement, the claimant had accepted. The company had entered into an agreement to pay £100 and thus needed to make good its debt. However, while the Court of Appeal held in Carlisle that the Carbolic Smokeball Company's advertisement was an offer capable of acceptance, not all statements are necessarily contractual offers. A line of case law has developed differentiating between an offer and what is termed an invitation to treat. What is an invitation to treat? If an offer is a statement that a party is willing to enter into an agreement on specific terms which is capable of acceptance, an invitation to treat is a statement that a party is willing to have someone make an offer to them. Critically, an invitation to treat is not capable of acceptance. The response to an invitation to treat may be an offer capable of acceptance, but one cannot accept an invitation to treat for there is no offer to accept. There are a number of cases on invitation to treat in different situations, and I suggest that you take a look at them. These include cases around adverts in the classified section of newspapers, of goods displayed on shop shelves, uh, or in shop windows, as well as at auction. Whether, for example, someone's bid at an auction is an offer, which the auctioneer accepts, or acceptance of the auctioneer's offer. 
In the classic case of Pain and Cave, the court held that somebody's bid at an auction was an offer, which the auctioneer accepted by banging her hammer on the desk, or some other form of clearly recognised acceptance. Rather than the position in which the auctioneer made an offer, which, by bidding, the bidder accepts. The critical difference is this. If the auctioneer makes an offer, which I accept by bidding, I cannot retract my bid. I have accepted the auctioneer's offer. Conversely, if, by bidding, I am making an offer, which the auctioneer accepts by banging her gavel, I can withdraw my bid at any time before the auctioneer accepts. Of course, this relies on the fact that I have an ability to withdraw my bid. In a traditional auction, in the real world, I might have to call out and say, I'm sorry, I retract my bid, before the auctioneer finishes the auction and accepts it. But what about an online auction site, such as eBay? eBay's terms say that a bid on eBay is considered a contract, and you are obliged to purchase the item. Of course, from what you have already learned, a bid cannot be a contract. It might be an acceptance of an offer which forms a contract, but by itself it cannot be a contract. Reading eBay's guidance more closely, you will probably discover that in some limited circumstances you can cancel a bid, but only under limited circumstances. eBay permits someone to cancel a bid if they accidentally type the wrong amount, such as putting £1,000 when they meant £100, if the seller changes the item's description significantly, or the buyer cannot get hold of the seller to ask a question. There are also time limits. Generally, eBay's rule is that you cannot simply change your mind, although you can ask the seller who might agree to the removal of your bid. Perhaps the most important point to think about here is the importance of understanding the terms and conditions of third-party sites that you use, or which someone is running, and the technical capabilities of the platform, since these, as much as your strict legal rights, control your relationship and your experience for that platform. A second area of particular relevance is that of tenders. In a tendering situation, you, as the would-be buyer, are intending to invite third parties to make offers to supply you with what you want. You might call these requests for information, RFIs, requests for quotation, RFQs, or even requests for proposals, RFPs. Whatever you call them, the general position is that a tender is an invitation to treat, and that someone responding to a tender does not enter into a contract simply by responding. Instead, the respondent is treated as having made an offer which is capable of acceptance. The leading case on this is an old one, Spencer and Harding, in which the court held that a tender is a mere attempt to ascertain whether an offer can be obtained within such a margin as the sellers are willing to accept. In other words, that someone sending out a tender is simply looking to see whether there is anyone willing to supply on suitable terms, rather than a commitment to buy from someone who responds saying that they can comply with the terms of the tender. A second impact of this is that someone responding to a tender needs to be careful to ensure that they are willing to be bound by what they put in their tender response, as they could be bound by it if the tenderer accepts their offer. You may also like to read a second case in tenders, that of Blackpool and Fylde Aero Club against Blackpool Borough Council. Somewhat more recent case, it focuses not on whether a response to a tender creates a contract, but whether someone sending out a tender is contractually obliged to consider all responses. In this case, the Court of Appeal found that someone who responds to a tender did have a right for their tender to be considered. Not, they said, as a matter of expectation, but of contractual right. However, the judgment may be seen as limiting this ruling to the circumstances of the case, rather than creating a rule of more general application. Lord Justice Bingham, for example, phrases his ruling in terms of tenders from selected parties, all of them known to the invitor, and where the invitation prescribes a clear, orderly and familiar procedure. Tenders which are open to all the world, rather than just a list of selected parties, may not be considered to be an offer of a contract to consider all responses, which the respondent accepts in sending back their proposal. To recap this section, I have talked about one of the six key principles of a binding contract, the offer. For there to be a legally enforceable contract, there must be an offer. 
which is a statement of one party that they are willing to enter into an agreement on specific terms on the basis of which, if accepted, the result is a binding contract. This offer is capable of acceptance, which creates a binding contract. Second, the law distinguishes between an offer and an invitation to treat, which you might think of as an invitation to make an offer. Many of the things which one describes as offers in everyday language may, from a legal perspective, actually be invitations to treat. For example, a shop putting products on display, or, increasingly, someone putting an item up for sale on a website. Given the case of Khalil and Smoke Carbolic Smokeball Company, vendors and advertisers will want to make sure that what they are doing is an invitation to treat, and not an offer, unless they are willing to be bound by what they have said.